This is Brother Ron, and welcome to We All Be News Radio and TV, the news free Dixie for the 21st century. We all bees on the phone, the one and only sister Emily Yellen. Yes. Okay, cool. I'll make sure I say that. No, no, yeah. Uh, she is a visionary on this project that concerns what happened 50 years ago with the sanitation working strike in good old Memphis, Tennessee. And we want to talk to her more about our project from the person standing in front of me, Sister Emily. How are you doing today? Hi there. Good to see you. It's an honor to see you as well. So why are your thoughts? I mean, what are you doing exactly for the 50th? Well, what sensation? a... Yeah. I've been working on a project called Striking Voices. And what it is, is uh, we have been interviewing sanitation workers, their wives, and their children for the last three years on videotape and then we've also everybody we interview we take really nice photos Darius B. Williams the photographer uh, takes <clears throat> portrait photos of them and the idea of the project is to center them and make them the authorities on their own lives usually when people talk about the sanitation strike or talk about the civil rights movement and it's, a lot of times it's a journalist like me or or uh, you know a, a historian a professor or something like that and that's a really valuable uh, point of view, but I really was dedicated in this project to making sure that the men and their families, their wives and their children who went through this on the front lines were the center and that their stories were centered in our work. I think this is a, I guess, relatively new way of doing storytelling, I guess, like in terms of the media. Do you agree that the people um, tell their own story like that? I'm not going to claim it's new, but I think for this story, as far as I know, it hasn't been done this way. I think other stories have been told this way, but the idea that um, you know that that we took men who uh, were workers and were on the front lines, and we interviewed them in the same setting we would interview a Harvard professor. So we set up. Uh, we had a location and we set it up and we had two cameras and we had a makeup artist and we treated them the same way we would if we were interviewing, you know, an uh, eminent historian. And I think that the just effect of that um, is kind of revolutionary. I, I talked to somebody who produced uh, Many Rivers to Cross, the Henry Louis Gates documentary, and she said that. She said when you interview participants in the civil rights movement, not necessarily the leaders, and you do that, it's actually an act of revolution because you're putting their voices in the same stature and equally to the leaders and the people who are usually interviewed in mainstream media. I also think about eyes on the prize when you said mm -hmm. that. That's another mm -hmm. one. So right. you following that tradition, but why has it taken so long to tell this particular story in such detail? Well, um, I think that it's the. I don't. Uh, that's. I can't answer that question. Because so yours is more in depth. I mean, I'm saying it's never really been this in depth on the right. sanitation workers. Well, like this. I mean, the thing we produce. I, again, I'm. I'm wary of claiming that we're doing some amazing thing uh -huh. other than what I just said. Mm -hmm. um, I think that other people have told the story. I think that one of the things 
things I've learned as a reporter over many years is that when you go through trauma, mm -hmm. sometimes it takes 20, 30, 50 years to talk about it and to be able to talk about it in a way where you can really, pro you've processed it and you can tell your feelings and you can really talk about it. So, you know, even with this story 50 years later, there were people who didn't want to talk to us, just didn't want to talk about it because it's too painful still. And then I interviewed a lot of the people I interviewed, the men and their wives and their children, um, you know, they cried. And one or two times people said, I haven't ever talked about this, you know, because it's just something you bury and that's what we do with trauma. But when you're reporting on it as a reporter, I have to be really sensitive to that and recognize that that's what I'm doing. So I think the fact that I am based in Memphis, that I've known this story my whole life, um, I grew up with my parents, uh, they documented the sanitation strike. So when I was six years old and this happened, I was in first grade with James Lawson's son, John. And you know, the, the Kyles family, the Lawsons, the Hookses, they were at our house when I was growing up. So I really grew up with this story and I think, you know, this is not my story, as I said to you before we talked, this is not my story and I never want to claim that. But I felt like I was in a position as a witness, you know, maybe, um, and as a journalist to be able to go in depth, like you said. And I also felt that it was really important to do it for the future. Um, the work my parents did the vision of that was a hundred years from 1968 if somebody wants to know what happened during the strike they're not necessarily going to know if all they have is the newspaper articles so my parents went out and they interviewed 150 people involved in the sanitation strike there's 400 hours of audio tape interviews at University of Memphis because of my parents and the joke in our family which I think your audience will appreciate is they said we interviewed everybody involved in the sanitation strike from Mayor Loeb on up wow so that had to be interest with Mayor Loeb Though. Right, right. <laughs> was but it the, but the, for them to do? Or? Yeah, but the joke was Mayor Loeb on up because he was the mayor. You usually say Mayor Loeb on down, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but, he, but they were like, he's the lowest right. of the low, so right. Mayor Loeb yeah. on up, right? Yeah, I, I mean, um, yeah. Well, you know, my father was a professor at University of Memphis in film and television. Mm -hmm. And so he interviewed him as a journalist, you know, and he went in there with an audio tape, uh, audio inter, um, yeah. recorder. Mm -hmm. And back then that was high tech, you know. Right. And they interviewed him and they asked him, him lots of questions, and that transcript and that audio tape interview is at the University of Memphis. So you basically continue, continue, uh, continue, excuse me, a family tradition. Yeah, there. in wow, a lot of ways. Amazing. And my yeah. older brother um, worked for ABC News, and he did a documentary on the sanitation strike in 1999 okay. for ABC, and it won an Emmy Award. That's excellent. So, so it is our it work. is a family thing. And then also, I want to give a give a shout out to Joan Bifus, who mm. uh, wrote a book called At the River I Stand, and that was sort of that is sort of the seminal book on the. Civil, on the sanitation strike. He a commercial appeal journalist? Or? And her son, John, is a commercial appeal okay, okay. journalist. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. yeah. Okay. So we both grew up with right. that story, um, you know, in our lives, our whole lives. So, yes, that is that is why a white woman from East Memphis is telling the story. <laughs> well, somebody got to tell it. But also, I want to ask you this. I think it's interesting that we could talk about Emmett Till and even recently Mike Brown and Trayvon Martin. And you know where I'm going with this. Why is the Larry Payne story not better known? You think? What's your theory behind that? Um, well, the Larry Payne story at the time was overshadowed by the man who was killed six days later. Mm -hmm. And the death of the man who was killed six days later. For your audience, Larry Payne was killed on March 28th, right after the riots. I, I, I'm sorry, I usually don't say riots. Right after the uprising downtown. Mm -hmm. And he was a 16-year-old and a police officer came to Fowler Homes Housing Project and, and shot him in the stomach. And it's a really troubling story story, but it echoes Mike, Mike Brown and Trayvon Martin, mm -hmm. everybody. It mm -hmm. echoes all the police uh, right. violence we've seen. There are a lot of police officers around right now, so I'm trying, <laughs> yeah, to, trying to be nice. Well, <laughs> he wasn't around 50, uh, they no, wasn't no, officers 50 no, years ago. No, exactly. Yeah. But um, that story, uh, you know, I think we see it differently. Again, there are some things that it takes 50 years for you to understand what even happened, you know, and I think we see it differently now than we would have seen it in 1968. However, mm -hmm. I want to say, my mother had the foresight to 
uh, she went to the lair there was a civil trial the, the policeman of course was not indicted mm -hmm. and so three years later the family brought a civil trial and my mother went to that civil trial and took notes and I have her notes and she sat through the whole trial and she was a journalist and I know why she did it she did it mm -hmm. because she felt she didn't want to trust the newspaper to tell the story and so she went uh, you know under the auspices of this project she went and sat and took reporters notes she had a master's degree in journalism from Northwestern so the good use <laughs> right Great use, right <laughs> and so for mm -hmm. me when I I just had an interest in that story anyway and then when I went to the when I went to the box about Larry Payne in the archives and saw that my mother had done this I was like this has just been left here for me my parents aren't around anymore and so that's about how I came to it but I'm, I'm, I'm slowly answering your question okay. um, what what I think is that at the time that police brutality was definitely an issue in 68 and we have James Lawson talked about it Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in an amazing way, and he really highlighted it. And I remember as a little kid, I was six, and I remember people mentioning police brutality and going, what's that? And, and then when I heard about it, it sounded terrible, you mm -hmm. know, as a six-year-old. Anyway, um, I think that back then, uh, a lot of people didn't feel, in the African-American community, didn't feel they had the voice. They didn't have the voice to do that. There wasn't social media. There wasn't all these ways in which to, um, you know, really show what people felt who were experiencing it. I think if you look at the Tri-State Defender and look at their coverage, you can see. Uh, and But that was not considered necessarily mainstream white media. It's really interesting. We've been looking at a lot of the film from back then that my parents saved mm -hmm. and that's at the archive. And when you see press conferences, mm -hmm. it's all white men and one or two white women. Wow. And that's it. Yeah, that's but it's awesome. mostly all white men. <laughs> so I know uh, Irvin Saki was the lawyer yes. for the family, right? Yes. And, and you, do, for do the you, Payne family. Yeah. yeah. Do you know if, it, if the officer, I guess, Officer L.D. Jones, mm -hmm. who he was, is he still around? I, I do not know that. Mm -hmm. I tried to find out. Mm -hmm. I tried to find out, and I'm going to look into it further. You and I are, are, are we've been interested in this for a while, yeah, and we just, talked. It's yeah, like, it's like a John Grisham novel. I don't know, how, <laughs> like Pelican Brief or like uh, right. I don't know what's going on. But Except that it's real. It's very much real. You know, and I I have talked to the Payne family. I don't want to say too much about that because mm -hmm. I want to respect their privacy, mm -hmm. and you have too. I know yeah. you you spoke to uh, uh, Larry Payne's sister and his mom and his uh, brother. Right. Yeah, but she died. The mom died. Yeah. Last the mom died. Flint of all places. Exactly. Right? <laughs> horrible. That's right? what I said. I know. Up. You can't make it up. And I, I actually spoke to her when she was in a, a, a I, I, it was like a, I don't know what it was, but it was a, a, a like a rehab place. Yeah. And um, because she had kidney issues, I yeah. think. And partly it's because of the water, you know. Yeah, at the end of that, she never got over the trauma of what happened to her right. son. You know, you right. talked to her, she just break down and cry over yep. that. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, her, his one brother, mm -hmm. um, I've talked to two of his brothers that live in Flint. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just the fact that they live in Flint is just stunning, you know. Um, again, you know, this is a really important story for us as Memphians, but it's also an important story as a nation to understand that this kind of violence, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's not just 50 years old, it's 500 years old, you know, the right. kind of violence against African Americans in this country and state-sponsored violence, you know, and I'm not saying that as some raving radical, I mean, Okay, so you, how could we look at your project? Yeah, um, it is on theroot.com. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called 1300 Men, and this is what we, we've done almost 30 hours, more than 30 hours of interviews with the men and their wives and their children. But we distilled that down into 11 six-minute videos, and we tell the story of the strike. And we started on January 15th, MLK Day this year, and our last story will go up on April 8th. 18th because it's about the aftermath of the strike, but we have a story on April 16th about the end of the strike. So here we are on April 5th, yep. 2018, and I've been telling everybody, everybody I see who's been working on this and, you know, the reporters that have been working on it and people who've been doing events, they say they're so tired today and I feel mm -hmm. very exhausted myself, mm -hmm. but I woke up this morning and I said, imagine if you were a sanitation worker in 1968, 50 years ago, and last night... Martin Luther King was killed here helping you. 
and you have to wake up this morning and you're still on strike and you don't know what's going to happen. And when I realized that, I got out of bed today and I said, we're going to keep going and we're still working. And I think that that is a lesson to us all, you know. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think the the key what, what what I said about this project is that the sanitation did I already say this thing about the sanitation workers being uh, uh, sorry you, no, no, can, are you gonna edit this yeah out? yeah I'm gonna edit. you, okay, ahead, you can cut go. this part out yeah. all right if I already said it you can cut it out mm -hmm. but what, what we really tried to do is that usually when this story is told of the sanitation workers it's they are the they are a chapter in somebody else's story. The sanitation strike, the sanitation workers themselves and their families are just a chapter in Martin Luther King's story or in mm -hmm. the civil rights movement mm -hmm. or uh, in Memphis history or labor history. Mm -hmm. And what we tried to do with our video project is make the sanitation strike a chapter in their lives. And so you hear about how they grew up and many of them were born on plantations in Mississippi and had to escape essentially, but that's that's maybe not the right word, but um, they, they left plantations and came here and this was supposed to be somewhere where they had more opportunity. And then they find themselves in the sanitation department which was run like a plantation, you know, and Mayor Loeb was the plantation boss. And so it was a real disheartening thing and this strike was them just saying that's it enough you know we're not going to take it anymore and they really are a generation who um, took the opportunities that came along and did with them amazing things and one of my favorite uh, people is one of the first people that we interviewed I mean I love all of the people we interviewed mm -hmm. I really do and we all do our whole crew mm -hmm. um, but we interviewed Alvin Turner and he's no longer with us and he wasn't here this week for all of this but I was thinking of him a lot wow. and and Alvin Turner uh, was born on a plantation in Mississippi and he started working at the age of seven years old in the cotton fields. And there's a quote in our piece where he says, you know, my daddy, he got me out in the cotton field and he handed me a cotton sack and he said, now you aren't out here to play, you're out here to work. And he's been working ever since. And he didn't get to go to school, so he didn't get to read. And so he never learned to read. And this man, who was illiterate, ended up being one of these heroes. And many of the men, that's a similar story. But the, the thing that really struck me with Alvin Turner, and it's true of a lot of people, but he's a great example. His daughters, two of his daughters have PhDs. And his daughter, Sherry, she was uh, the vice president of students at Spelman. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah, that's And, awesome. you know, people uh, would say, oh, well, you know, that just shows the initiative and the, the pull yourself up by your bootstraps and all that. I said, no, 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 no. What that shows is 400 years of wasted talent. Oh, wow. You know? Yeah. Because, <laughs> I mean, the minute opportunity existed, he took it. And then his daughters took it, and he made sure they were able to. And look, look at the talent that we've wasted. And that's really how, what, that's one of the main things I've learned from this project. My mother sort of, my parents brought me up thinking that way, but I've really seen it in action. And um, when you take the stories of these men and their wives, I don't want to, I don't want to ever forget their wives because their wives went on strike with them. Mm -hmm. And you look at them in their own right, get rid of all the context, and you just look at them in their own right as a life, mm -hmm. you know? What they have done and who they are and what they have fought and what they've had to put up with, and they still come out. I mean, the, the one thing I have seen with almost, well, with everybody we've interviewed, I can't speak for the whole 1,300 men because we didn't interview all of them, but uh -huh. it's just the love, you know? Love is what lives on, and love is what gets you through. and. I always believe love is the most important thing. And what's so sad to me is that people who look like me, mm -hmm. <laughs> who are white, mm -hmm. don't understand how the hate that our race has perpetuated uh, in this country and is really responsible for, how it, how it flows through generations and affects people and that mm -hmm. trauma I talked about. Mm -hmm. But what's so heartening is that the love is what wins out. That does not excuse anybody. But I'm just saying, 
if you've got to find hope somewhere otherwise why even keep going right, right? <laughs> so I just I just think that's that's a, a huge lesson and, and then the last thing I want to say or maybe it's the last thing is, is the women um, mm -hmm. the the wives of the men most many of them supported their families during the strike and beyond you know uh, I mean financially right, right. Uh, many of the women we interviewed had jobs at that time um, some worked as domestic workers in white people's houses in East Memphis uh, and they for some you know if their employer had found out that their husband was one of the men going on strike they might have been fired and so it was really a risk this wasn't just I'm gonna stand up and somebody might not like me this is I'm gonna stand up and my family might not have dinner tomorrow Wow. You know, mm -hmm. and so the courage it took to do that, but also what that says is it must have been so horrible that they said, that's it, you know? Right. Right. So I just don't want us to forget that the time at that time and the conditions, the things we take for granted now that we're so lucky to have that these men and women won for us, mm -hmm. I don't want us to forget how important what they did was and just sort of see it as some history you know mm -hmm. so that's that's probably my big oh and then the last thing I uh, this is the last thing I uh, promise uh, is is the children mm -hmm. you know I was six years old at the time and I remember that like I said I was in school with James Lawson's son John and mm -hmm. but when I talk to the sons and daughters of sanitation workers and they can still cry mm -hmm. about something that happened 50 years ago and cry about seeing their father humiliated you know one of the one of the leech uh, Baxter leech's children Michael leech told us about how he his, one of his memories is his father coming home from a march and running into the bathroom to wash his face because he had tear gas in his eyes mm. I mean, I don't have a memory of that with my dad, right. you know, right. <laughs> and then and then uh, seeing your father, they were saying the day after uh, the day after Martin Luther King was killed and they saw the National Guard coming in the neighborhood and his father's walking down the street and the National Guard is behind him and he's thinking, they're going to get my dad, they're going to get my dad, wow. you know, that kind of thing when you grow up with that that leaves something with you for the rest of your life and that's what's been really interesting too is to really think you know what if you were six years old or what if you were 15 mm -hmm. and you understood you know a lot of the high school students Hamilton High School Booker T mm -hmm. a, a lot of those students marched and walked out and did things at that time because they saw what was happening mm -hmm. So it's an amazing story. And like you said, and you know, we've talked, it's, there's so many ways to tell it and mm -hmm. things to do. So I just, I just feel like as long as we are here and the men and their families are still here, we need to listen, we need to record it, we need to keep it because a hundred years from now, they'll be gone. Right. We'll be gone. Right. And people say, why didn't somebody record that? <laughs> they had all those things, they had all that, <laughs> they had all that yeah. technology and they didn't, right. do they didn't do and it. And so that's why I'm glad my parents did it, you know, and that's why I felt the obligation to do it myself. Thank you, Sister Emily, and the words are great to go to, and we love you. Matt Lee, keep on producing and pushing. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it.